Welcome to Your Career Podcast, the podcast that helps to ensure your career success. To start getting on track with your career, download my free career goals calendar from thecareersacademy.online. My goals calendar includes a smart goals template and a weekly tasks sheet that will ensure step by step you get closer to reaching your career goals. So download my goals calendar today at thecareersacademy.online. Now on with the show. Trevor Weeding is the recently appointed Head of Operations and HR for Tripod Australia and Senior Consultant at Enigma HR. After a successful 35-year career in the media industry, he reinvented himself in 2014 and embarked on a new career path based in Sydney's southern suburbs, focusing on connecting local business and their community. He spent 10 years as a board member at ESBEC, which is the Eastern Suburbs Business Enterprise Centre, supporting small-medium enterprises with training and skill support. Trevor has also been on the boards of Community Radio, 2NBC FM and the Morris Children's Fund and is still a keen supporter for the St George Medical Research Foundation. Now, after three years in the recruitment and HR industry, Trevor started Development Pathways in early 2020, where his passion for assisting small business became his business. This led him to being chosen for his new role at Tripod Australia and Enigma HR, and we're going to learn all about that very soon. Now, the law of reciprocity is a mantra for Trevor, and he is a BNI member and member of three local business chambers. So let's welcome Trevor to the show. Hello, Jane. Thanks for having me, and it's a pleasure to be here. You know, this is a long time coming. It's taken us too long to actually get you on this podcast because I've wanted to interview you for ages. And so I'm delighted that we finally are able to connect. And I have to share with everybody that I was prompted to ask Trevor to come on to this podcast because I posted something, which we'll talk about later, which um, was a bit of an icky video on LinkedIn. And he provided me with a very interesting comment. And I thought, oh, I better get him on the podcast. So to kick us off, Trevor, I want to ask you my very favorite first question for my podcast, which is, what were your early career aspirations when you were a little boy? So I'm sure when I was very little, I must have wanted to be a fireman or a policeman or (laughs) superman or something like that. The one I can remember that I first took seriously was I I played for about age 12. I started playing in brass band, uh, playing brass instruments at school first. And uh, I wanted to join the army and and join the army as an apprentice, but I'd be an apprentice musician. My father and mother just flatly, especially my dad, just flatly refused to let it happen because I was under... 18, they would have had to sign. Looking back, it was probably a good move, but it was definitely a passion and I could see it. The thing that frustrated me uh, not very many years later is my brother uh, joined the Air Force at age 17 as an apprentice and he had a a very long career, which is still just coming to an end now with the Air Force and uh, defence support. So it hurt a bit at the time, but yeah, I was going to be a muso. Okay, there we go. A muso, and I do like musos. <laughs> and so you play a variety of int- instruments? Uh, well, it's like- brass is a little bit like a piano keyboard. When you know where the notes are, you can play pretty much everything, although the, the mouthpiece size varies, as any musos out there will, will tell you. Mm-hmm. Um, I played the bigger end. I played a euphonium, and uh, because I was a reasonably large chap, you know, six feet tall, etc., uh, I would very often end up on a, a in an orchestra they call a tuba, but in a brass band they call it a bass. Ah, um, a euphonium. Is that what you call a it? A euphonium, yes. A euphonium. Yeah. I've never yeah. heard of that before. So basically um, it's a tuba. It's a small tuba, but it's it's one of the – in a brass band, it's a principal instrument. In an orchestra, you're lucky to find one. Oh, live and learn, euphonium. Yeah. Hello to all the <laughs> UFO players out there who might be listening and watching. <laughs> yeah. If anyone is one, please let me know, because now I've learned this new word, I'm going to try and work it into everything I talk about. From those early aspirations and not not making it into the army and being very jealous of your of your brother in the air force, uh, what was your first job? 
So I, I went um, to a technical school back in, in the day. I'm talking the 1970s here, folks, but I went to a technical school in Victoria. Uh, there was roughly one tech school for every four or five high schools in the region. And that's mainly because my dad was a, a tradie, it was a, a turner and fitter by trade and then a mechanic, and you just want to follow your dad's footsteps. Uh, it came very, very clear, very, very quickly. I was never going to be a tradie. I'm a klutz. I can, I can hammer in nails and do stuff, but I'm, I'm not the tradie in the family by far. But there was an opportunity to, to do a, a business study stream uh, towards the end of my time at secondary school. And I then went on to university to study accounting. Uh, it was a four-year degree in those days. And I got halfway through year four and said, this is not for me. Um, I won't bore you with the whole details, but it was just think about the time. It's the late 1970s. There were no desktop computers. The computer at the uni took up the whole floor of the building, Jane. This would have been three years of sitting with a green biro as an auditor. I, I called it an apprentice auditor, which is pretty much what you're expected to do in those days. Getting a job wasn't going to be a problem. The big accounting firms used to come to the unis looking for staff in those days. Uh, but I just did not want to do that. Was, I could not turn my brain off to the point of sitting there, I thought, and I'm mind-numbingly ticking with a green bar, ticking other people's work. Mm. And I needed a job, so I applied at my local community newspaper for a, an accounting clerical job that was going and having an honest discussion with the accountant who interviewed me. And uh, to his credit, he said, Trevor, if that was going to drive you nuts, this is not going to be much better for you. I tell you what, the sales manager needs a cadet sales rep. Here's how you find his office. You get around there now. I'm going to call him and tell him you're on the way. And I never worked my way through the corridors and tapped on the man's door and he called me in because he knew what was going on. And the first thing he said is, why do you want to be a sales rep? And I said, the accountant told me to come and see you. I don't know. <laughs> But I had, to my credit, I had worked after school in a local hardware store as a, like a shop assistant. So I knew about customer service and, and sort of stuff. But that started the career. I started as a cadet sales rep at the Dandenong Journal. And uh, that was, as you said in the intro, that was the start of a 35-year career in that industry. Isn't that amazing? You know, that you go for an interview for one job, realize it's not quite for you, but then another opportunity in the same company arises. I've seen this happen with a number of my clients as well, where, where the hiring manager said, you know, I really like your attitude and what you can do, but this job is not for you. Have you thought of this other opportunity? So yep. I'm glad that that happened. And, and so you enjoyed your sales roles. Yeah, very much. Mm -hmm. Um you, you were, if you got the got the right mindset and you got it right, uh, you were very much a, an important part of those small business owners, businesses. Think about high street shops. That's what we're talking about for a, mm. a community newspaper. Um, you, you become their trust, literally, as they say, their trusted advisor. Uh, and what tends to happen is that the cowboys will fly in and in those days, it used to be radio stations and the yellow pages and try and take away as much of the, the budget as they could. And sometimes I was successful because they were pretty slick salespeople. Um, I, I Sales training over the years, I went from when I started, it was still the old foot in the door sort of sales training approach that you got. Don't take no for an answer. Make sure the husband and wife are in the room at the same time, you know, all those sort of things. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, after a couple of different inventions, we ended up with what we have, I still think today, in the best practices, relationship selling. Yeah. Uh, and, and really trying to find the client's pain points. And if you can help them, then you do. And if you're not the right solution, being honest enough to say that you're not the right solution. So after 35 years in, in a sales role, so you must have moved up, you know, one step at a time and getting yeah. into more and more senior roles within sales. How, how did the, your sales career progress? So it was very much, look, it was, think about a, a graph, I don't know, following the Aussie dollar or something like that. It was a trend upwards, thank goodness, but it had its dips along the way. Mm. Um, all of those things that can happen in that length of time, um, I say flew too close to the sun after about seven or eight years. Um, was headhunted for a role that should, I should never have been chosen for, and the role shouldn't have existed, actually. Uh, I only lasted three months. But that, like a snakes and letters game, Jane, that set me back down to a, a more junior role that I had left, if you like. I had to build my career from scratch all over again, uh, which was fine. It was tough at the time, but it, it did me no harm whatsoever. It deflated what was getting to me a little bit of a big head, to be honest, in some cases. Yeah. 
uh, but worked my way up. Uh, by the time I got towards the end of my career and the, the move from Melbourne to Sydney is a good example of that, I went from managing, like leading sales teams and things like that to actually managing business units in the newspaper industry. So I, I came to Sydney to manage News Limited's community newspapers um, network office. So for the first time, I had to actually worry about all those things that managers need to worry about, about health and safety in the office. And I had a receptionist in my team who didn't generate any sales, but I, she was part of the the budget that I was responsible for. And I had support people as well as just salespeople and so on. So by the time my career there uh, finished, when I left, I was managing the Fairfax's flagship community newspaper here in Sydney. Um, and it was it was very much a management role. It was no longer sales as such, but it was managing the sales team, the sales managers and the sales people. Yeah. Ah, okay, so take, going out of your technical competency into more of a leadership role. You know, I want to, yeah. let's just wind back a little bit. I'm really interested in this bit where you were really successful in your sales role. You took on a new role, which was not right for you. It lasted three months and it obviously must have affected your confidence or self-belief too, where you had to restart your career from the bottom up. Because I think your story will be very inspiring for the listeners because, you know, when you make a decision, if it's not quite the right decision, it doesn't mean the be all and end all. So, yeah. so talk us through that. So you were doing really well. There was this opportunity, you decided to take it, but... Yeah, but look, it was the wrong time of the year. It was I came on board in early December, and as we know, things just go quiet over Christmas. Uh, the person who I reported to had been promoted, uh, but refused to let go of the reins, so that clients would still call him. And him, instead of him saying Trevor's the guy now, he'd still take the details and take the sale. So I basically had to just concentrate on new business. I wasn't allowed to look after existing clients. Just a bad fit. Mm. Um, can I say though the experience when I left there and then I needed a job and I went back to community newspapers and pounding the beat, if you like, as a local sales rep again. Um, it was in those days the equivalent of having a good profile on LinkedIn or something of that nature because my reputation uh, was known a little bit. I wasn't known to, to the world, but in the microcosm of that industry, it's a fairly incestuous one. The person I ended up working under knew of me without knowing me personally and was able to check, apart from formal reference checks, was able to ring people that I'd worked with or worked under and say, hey, is this guy for real? Is he, you know, he's coming back to this job where he's capable of that one. Mm. Um, and it's similar to what you see today where someone can go and look at your presence. If your LinkedIn profile is not up to scratch, it's not going to help you or sort of stuff. So it, it was, I, I needed a job and it was tough, but the, the career progression from there went relatively quickly. So within about uh, we about two years, I was back to the level I'd been, if you like, um, because I could do the work, I could guide others, I wouldn't call it mentoring, but I could certainly guide others working under me who were newer, uh, assist the manager. I Never any formal roles, but you just do those things. So the experience earlier w was not wasted, Jane, that's for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, I think every, every experience, whether it's good or bad, easy or a challenge, it all forms part of the rich tapestry of your life and career as well, and also helps you to build resilience, doesn't it? So that you know that you can bounce yes. back. And a decision is never fatal. It's It might be a good decision, it might be a bad decision, it might not be right, but you can always come back. And I think that's that's an important lesson that, that everybody needs to learn. Because I do have sometimes some clients, they come to me and they they just say, oh, you know, I've I've made all the wrong decisions and I don't see a way forward at all. But there is, if you are very clear as to what's most important to oh, you. for sure. Well, this was, I mean, I was like 26, 27 years old with six mm. or seven years experience, which is not bad. Mm. But at 26 or 27, there's a lot of time left in your life and in your working life as well. So, yeah, it's not the end of the world. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. And actually, when we really think about it, whether you're in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s or even 50s, we've got so much life ahead of us. Indeed, even when you're in your 60s, there's still so much life ahead of us because our lifespan is getting longer and longer because we're healthier and healthier now. And, you know, medical advances are so good that so many do live into their late 80s and 90s. So those who are thinking, oh, you know, 50, 55 retirement, which is what it used to be, you've got so many years ahead of you. What on earth are you going to do? So I think when you find what's important to you, 
you in your career and you're on the right path, which you got back on to the right path again. Yeah. And now you've got this, this long, very interesting career. And so needing from the sales roles and to leadership roles and then back at Fairfax and community newspapers, you became an HR specialist. How did that happen? Well, that, that was more by accident than design. Um, I, I had to leave the industry to move back to Melbourne for my parents. They, they were both unwell. In fact, my father passed away before we could even complete the move. He went downhill very quickly. Mum passed away about 13 months later. Mm. And because I'd been in Sydney for so long, all my contacts were here by now. My partner's family were all up here. So coming, we could have happily stayed in Melbourne, but coming back was the right decision. Mm. Um, I did a couple of other things that you mentioned, St. George Southern Medical Research Foundation. I worked for them to help them connect with the local community a bit more uh, for a couple of years. Um, my partner and I made a decision to, uh, with my own business, to pack up and move to the Philippines, would you believe? Mm -hmm. uh, and had it all gone well, we'd be staying there. But again, for family reasons, we had to come back after just four months. And it was when I got back. Uh, and again, it's, it shows you the value of having, thank goodness, a good reputation. Uh, I was at a networking event. I'd only been back a week. And it's a little bit like going to school with a broken arm and everyone wants to know what happened and you've got to tell the story over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, people at the networking event were saying, hey, you moved overseas. What are you doing here? Uh, one of the people in the room, and I don't mind giving you her name and being, giving her a thank you, is a lady named Catherine McMillan mm -hmm. from Circle Recruitment and HR. It used to be called something different. Catherine sat next to me and said, Trevor, what are you going to do now? I said, look, I don't know. This was not part of the plan. And she pushed me her business card and said, come and have a coffee with me and have a chat. And she needed a business development manager. I needed a job. And that was how I ended up in, in this, this industry. Ah, and it was, again, just fortuitous. Uh, it was good because the the leadership training with the large media organisations, particularly News Limited at Fairfax, you don't get to be a manager. Uh, they don't let you run business units without putting you through proper training. So I, I already had a, a reasonable understanding of hiring and firing and what I could say in an interview and what I couldn't say in an interview, what I could ask and so on. Uh, it wasn't like I was a total naive person in that part of the world, but the um, the opportunity uh, presented itself. That's right. And I, um, I joined uh, the industry via what is now Circle Recruitment and HR. How fantastic. So a big thank you to Catherine. There we go. <laughs> sure. And that also highlights the importance of your network and being able to express yourself and tell people who you are, what you do, you know, what you actually bring to the table so people can start to think on your behalf as to, hey, I wonder if he or she could fit here or there. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. And so so you must have really enjoyed being in the recruitment industry, transitioning into human resources, all all about the people, um, because you ended up starting your own business as well. I did. Yes. Yeah. Look, I um I left Circle when and they were still called nine to three at that stage, but I left Circle and uh started my own business. The plan originally was quite different and the timing will resonate with a lot of people I know. I started my own business in December 2019 and we all know what happened in early 2020. And I no sooner got the business model down pat, the business plan down pat, um, it included income from the Philippines where I'd be training people over there as part of it. Uh, and then COVID hit and business plan number one was torn up almost overnight basically. Mm. Uh, by the end of that year, I was on business plan number three. But that's that's a story that's typical of a lot of small businesses, I'm sure, during that period. Okay? So it wasn't the greatest timing, but uh, it took, um, took the full of the three years. L last year, as in last calendar year, was def every year was better than the last. Last year, it took me until then to get it to where I had hoped it would be at the end of year one in mm. terms of performance and income and size and everything but again i'm i know from a lot of my clients uh, that's a very typical story and it was never meant to be purely hr it was meant to be a, a more of a generalist business consultancy drawing on all of those different experiences i'd had including studying accounting i i can still look at a PL and understand what it's all about in a balance sheet mm -hmm. um but it, it just didn't work out the way it was originally intended to so, 
Yeah. Although you've got all of those skill sets that are required of anyone who's running a business because you understand the finances, you understand the sales process, you understand how to lead people, how to hire and fire. And so really you're the full package, yes. And and COVID was so difficult for so many businesses. I, I have to admit that as a career coach, though, for me, I have never been as busy as during COVID because so many people were stood down and they were reevaluating the meaning of life. And so being a career coach at that point in time was very much in demand, I found. I was quite surprised. My accountant, my tax accountant was very surprised. He goes, oh, <laughs> you've had a bumper a few years. And I said, yes, I know. it's crazy, isn't it? But um, but that's the good thing, because I was working on, I transitioned my business to all online in 2018 before COVID hit. And so when COVID did hit, it was business as usual for me. It just ramped up. But now, now, after Development Pathways, you've had this amazing opportunity through BNI. And BNI, again, it's all to do with networking, yes? And so tell tell me about Tripod. Tell me about this new opportunity and how it came about. So the Tripod and Enigma HR, the, the sister companies, if you like, uh, have been around for many, many years. Uh, Lisa Garrido is the, the owner and the CEO and the founder and so on. Um, Lisa is taking on in 2024 a more senior role within the BNI organisation here in Sydney and needed somebody to come in as in this role as operations manager. Uh, the business had grown significantly. It's been very successful, but it was already at the point where she probably needed somebody, but it was definitely going to be needing someone there. So um, we knew each other through through the BNI network. Uh, it, the work that I do with clients is very similar to what I was doing with my own business. Uh, a slightly different business model, of course, you get that when the way people, work, how, you, how you charge your fees, how you allocate your time and so on. But uh, there's... The core is still there in terms of this is my pain point, this is my problem. Um, in a perfect world, a HR consultant should be the fire prevention officer who comes in and helps you to get all your ducks in a row so that you minimise the opportunity for issues to arise with your staff and your teams. Uh, in reality, we are more often than not the, the fireman who comes in and puts out the fire because you didn't have all of that or because something went wrong or something didn't work, Jane. So that, that hasn't changed a whole lot, that's for sure. Tell me, what what, what is Tripod? What, what, what is your, who, who are your clients? So Tripod provides a, a bespoke um, offshore uh, team solution for you. Uh, with development pathways, I would I was always what I called the back of the bus up guy. If someone called me in uh, initially to say, "Look, I, I want to my business is growing. I need to take on someone to help me," it would, and I used to work with the micro end of the small business spectrum, so a sole trader ready to grow. Uh, I'm a lawn mowing company. I'm going to take on another employee, and I used to say, "Well, hang on, stop. Let's go back a bit. What are they actually going to do? Is there really enough work for that?" And you would very often find people who might have had an administration role, and they said, "And I want them to do the bookkeeping as well." I said, "Well, if you want someone who's a qualified bookkeeper, you've just added thousands of dollars to the salary." And how many hours a week are they actually doing bookkeeping for that? And the answer was invariably one to two or something of that nature. So why would you pay this much more for just one or two hours extra work a week? Let's help you find a bookkeeper through my BNI network who I can connect you with. It will cost you way less than that for the year. Now, let's look at what's left in the role. And why do you need a full-time person? Can they do that in three days a week? Mm -hmm. um, and if you want someone with experience three days a week, you're probably going to get an older person who's maybe returning to the workforce, uh, maybe a, a mother who's got young children at home or something like that. You're probably going to get someone with a bit more experience if the job's part-time these days. So let, just that sort of thinking process to take people through. If the best solution for your business is to have the role done offshore, for all sorts of reasons, cost savings, uh, efficiencies, and so on, then I had connections that I could put people in. Tripod was one of those. Mm -hmm. Tripod provides that bespoke solution for people, for that offshore. Uh, we are not a BPO, mm -hmm. uh, but we also don't just manage freelancers for you. We actually provide you with those team members. Uh, we manage them for you in the Philippines, but they're your team. You direct them, you guide them. You give them the work, you train them, all of that stuff as well, but we will never pull them out of there and put them on with some another client. 
Hmm. We would never ah, do so that. They're to dedicated your, to your, your they're dedicated to your business. We've helped recruit them, but you've selected them uh, along the way, and you run them. They're part of your team. We then run them from an operations point of view, paying their wages, giving them a desk if you want them to sit at our office, hmm. uh, providing them with the computer if you haven't got one. You send them all that stuff there. So it's very much a bespoke solution, but it it just takes all of that pain out. Uh, people who are probably going to go and make a very bad decision trying to find a freelancer mm. uh, with all of the risks that that involves. So, yeah, it sounds like the ideal solution for a growing business and um, they'll be able to test it out and to see if they indeed do need those particular skills. Exactly right. And so do you focus on finance, admin, HR, marketing, any, sales? Is it the whole any, government running? Any business? job that can be done sitting at a desk in a computer, basically. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, but certainly, yeah, admin roles, mm. uh, finance industry is a large one, um, mortgage brokers, uh, where you need that back-end services. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've long since, I, I used to argue this, when I didn't have the direct relationship where I was simply referring people to businesses I trusted offshore. Um, often people say, oh, you're sending jobs overseas and, you know, that, that could have been done by an Australian. Well, no, they... The business simply cannot afford the wages. Mm -hmm. And if you do it right, particularly for trade-related businesses, um, get the admin support done over there, you've saved an awful lot of money, and now you can put another van on the road, and now you can take on an apprentice here. So in a lot of ways, it actually generates jobs. Yeah, I, I agree. I think if you can, you know, save money as a business um, where you don't have to have, you know, that that additional headcount, but then be able to reinvest your uh, in your business, in what is really necessary, so that it can grow. Having having this solution is actually very very sensible, isn't it? Yeah, look, it's not for everyone, but if it's if it is right for you, then hopefully we're the right business to provide that for you. That's yeah. Oh, well, congratulations on joining Tripod. And I'm sure that with your skill set, you'll be able to help it grow. You know, Trevor, I'm I'm just, I, I want to circle back to the reason why this podcast was prompted, because I had shared this post on LinkedIn. And thank you so much for, yeah. for engaging in this post, because I was talking about the interview process. And I mean, you're an expert on the interview process yeah. um, as because you've been on both sides of the table. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so I had posted this video of Ricky Gervais in a very funny short clip, but it was a very awkward interview situation because basically he was playing the part of a very sleazy boss interviewing a rather pretty, yes. pretty young <laughs> lady. And I the the post was all about trust your gut feeling because he at the end of this this clip he says oh you've got the job now should the woman have taken the job or not and so just because you're offered a role doesn't mean you have to say yes sometimes job seekers feel that because there's an offer on the table they don't know you know how long it might be before another offer comes they take the wrong role and it could end up being disastrous because if you're in the wrong environment or it's toxic or the culture doesn't match your own values, it can really play havoc with your mental health and well-being. Now, you said something intriguing in, in this comment and that, um, well, one one change was because you had to move to Melbourne because of, you know, family and looking after yes. uh, your parents. But then you said that there was another very interesting interview that would require us sitting down and having a glass of wine yes. or a cup of coffee before you'd tell me. So now I have got you on the podcast. Podcast, tell me about that dreadful experience so others can learn from it. Well, it, it was pretty much how not to go about recruiting people, I suppose. And there was no sexual harassment or anything of that nature. So if, if you're sitting on tender hooks waiting for that, no, that's not the story, guys. This is about um, organisations forgetting, I think, that they are employing people, human beings, mm -hmm. and they're not just numbers on a spreadsheet. And where's the bigger organisation? And having worked for some bigger ones, unfortunately, that's where you end up. You end up as a head count on a spreadsheet. Um, you know, it's roles that are made redundant, we know, but there are people attached to each one of those roles. And so uh, without naming names, uh, because the story is my version of it, maybe there's some you know, license being taken, but a uh, particular media organisation was advertising a role. And I said to my boss at the time, this would be a perfect role for me. I don't want to go for it, but they could be poaching some of our team if we're not careful. So with your approval, I'm actually going to apply for it and be a bit sneaky. 
and just go through the initial interview. But I'm going to be up front with them and tell them um, I, I'm here to learn about this role. And may, who knows, if you make it the right offer, of course, I'll think about moving. But, I'll, you know, as upfront as I could be. The interview was with a very inexperienced HR officer who told me way too much, even though I told them very clearly who I was and what I was currently doing, way too much information. Um, but I was called back a couple of days later by a very senior person who I would have been reporting to had I got the job. And it was the day that that company was taken over by a much, much larger multinational media organisation. Mm -hmm. We can probably guess who it might be. But it was the day that the announcement happened. And while I'm sitting there in the interview, someone knocked on the door and said to this lady, you have to come now. And she just got up and said, I'm sorry, we'll have to do this another day. And she left. And she left the room. And by the end of that day, she'd left the business, had all of the people at that level of the org chart. <laughs> so the takeover happened and people were made redundant on the spot, essentially, as the takeover occurred. And had I ended up joining there. The, the offer was still on the table for me to join, by the way, oh. uh, after, after the takeover. And I said, no, thank you. I don't think this is where I want to be. But the point of the story was um, you weren't a human being at all. You were a space filler. We've got this vacancy. If we don't fill it, they'll take it out of the budget next year. These things were all said in the conversations. If we don't fill this role now, they'll take it out of the budget next year. It doesn't matter who owns the business and who's doing it. So we have to put somebody in there mm -hmm. into that role to fill it. And the moment it was no longer about people was where my interest just went straight out the door. Okay. Yeah. And I think it's so important to really trust your gut when you're in a job interview as well, because so often you're told things that you might think, oh, that doesn't quite sound right. Or is that a red flag? And you really need to ask the right questions to draw out as much information as you can during that interview process to find out if the environment is right for you. But oh, my goodness, for you for you to be halfway through an interview when the interviewer uh, is notified that their, their role has been made redundant. Yes. Go, go <laughs> off the announcements timing. being made to the stock exchange into the world and within a couple of hours um, they were clearing out their desks and mm -hmm. yeah, leaving the business. It's an emotional time, isn't it? Yeah, let's let's talk about redundancies and how businesses can do it better because there's something else that I, I've been discussing also on LinkedIn and that that is um, I, I shared a post. It, it, it was there was a business in America that was letting go a number of people and um, this this uh, woman knew that she was going to be notified of a redundancy and she actually recorded herself being notified and it has gone absolutely viral across um, all social media channels and it it was very sad because she was notified by two people whom she didn't know. Her manager didn't tell her. She um, had no advance notice that this was happening. It all just happened to many people all on the same day. And the two people who were notifying her couldn't answer any questions at all. And she had been performing very well in her role. And it was absolutely devastating. And the comments had been flowing fast and furiously um, in support of this post, because there are a lot of organizations who don't know how to handle that notification process when they have to downsize. Yeah. And it's so important to treat every single individual as an individual human being whose entire identity may be tied up with their job title. They could have been with the company many, many years, and they're very loyal, and they've dedicated themselves to this particular organization and that role. And then to have it just taken out from under them, much like having the rug pulled out from under you, mm -hmm. it can be so debilitating for many. What's your order? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Jane. I think, uh, again, remembering that to some extent, you've got to work for the business if you're a manager who's responsible for making redundancies. And those who are listening and have been in that situation will know you generally get told by someone up the org chart from you, you have to cut five roles from the budget and it's, you know, you go ahead and have to organise this and work it out. Um, I, I maintain there's no perfect way to do it, particularly if it's it's part of an ongoing process. And the pre-COVID, COVID was a whole massive disruptor for a lot of businesses, particularly the, the newspaper publishing industry. There are titles, community and regional papers that just don't exist anymore and never came back. Mm -hmm. But that was happening anyway in the, uh, the 1980s uh, and it was snowballing a bit. 
But I started in that industry, I'll say it now, at the end of 1979. And the technology at the time just coming in, the state of the art was punch tape, like a ticker tape, punch tape. Yes. And that had resulted in some redundancies in the industry. And it was just ongoing from then on. Um, as they brought in digital cameras, they didn't need as many photographers because the photographers didn't have to spend hours in the dark room developing the prints before they were sent through to the production area. And um, computer to plate technology meant that plate makers' jobs disappeared overnight, literally overnight. They maybe kept one on to push the buttons on the machine and to calibrate it if necessary. So it had been going on for decades by the time we got to the mid-1980s where I was last involved in being the person delivering the message about redundancies. And, but it was very, very personal. Mm. And how do you do it? Do you... Do you do that rip the Band-Aid off, call someone in and say, well, you know, we've been talking about redundancies. Well, it is your role, unfortunately, that is going to be made and literally do it on the spot. Um, or do you make an announcement and say, look, um, in the next couple of months, we're going to be looking at these redundancies. There are certainly going to be some that happen. We don't know at this stage, but we want to be upfront and honest with everyone that we are going to have to downsize the business and some roles will be going. And then you have people sweating for three months about whether it's going to be their role. It's, there's no perfect way to do it. Uh, but that example you gave, a perfect example of forgetting that there's a human being attached to the redundancy. That's, that's the, the biggest I, issue. I think it's a matter of um, how to respectfully deliver the message and to be really aware how it could affect each individual because everyone's got you know their own demons and things going on and mm -hmm. and we don't know what else is happening in their lives. And and I think the important thing is, is to offer support. If it has to happen, it has to happen because a business has to stay profitable. And so if it's a matter of headcount reduction in order for them to stay in business, then of course, as every business owner knows, there will be layoffs and redundancies. But if you're able within your budget to provide that support to them, to help them get back on their feet so that they're not on their own, because some people withdraw and um, you know they don't even tell their partners or their parents or whoever that they no longer have a role. And so having that um, coaching support is very important, wouldn't sure. you agree? Yeah, I couldn't agree. And I've, I've any time I've had to unfortunately um, make some redundant or assist in a redundancy, emphasizing constantly this is about the role, it's not about you personally. Mm. Um, the, your job literally does not exist mm. as of tomorrow. It's not as though we we want to sack you, the person. The, the role is just not there. Mm. And you can't drive a forklift, so we can't put you in the warehouse. Yeah. Um, we haven't got time to train someone to drive a forklift. We don't have a vacancy for a forklift driver and you're a clerical person. It's, yeah. uh, but it is difficult. Um, and the person who is being made redundant, their emotional levels are going to go up, which means that there's only so much logic that can fit in between their ears at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, the person delivering the news is probably going to try and keep it as logical and keep the emotion level down because... They have to get the message across. So it's, it is difficult. I had one particular person who said nothing's appeared to take it all in their stride. And it must have been the, the moment they walked out the door, they hit the, the enter key on their computer keyboard to send the email that they'd been writing and then disappeared out the door. But the email was very scathing. Mm. Uh, it was a shock to me because I hadn't seen any of the emotion that came out in the email. It seemed that it was doing well. But one of the things they'd done was they were comparing their payout with a fellow, with one of their colleagues mm. who did a completely different role, had been made redundant at the same time, but a completely different role, working under an enterprise agreement uh, where the redundancy provisions were quite different. And here was someone working in, without, under an award, basically, without that enterprise agreement. So comparing apples and oranges, and yet the, the referring to the fact that her husband is an accountant and they'd be looking into that. Thought, well, your husband could have probably advised you that there's a difference. But, yeah. but yeah. again, you just don't know. This was someone I thought had taken it reasonably well, but it was that all, it was all pent up until they hit that 
that enter button on the keyboard and then walked out the door. So. Yeah, and I think that that's where even you know, like even if everything is ticking along well within an organisation, it's 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 up to the leaders to maintain open communication and really get to understand their team members, and you know whether they're feeling motivated at work. If not, why not? You know how how could you um, help them to be more productive and more motivated? It's all it all boils down at the end of the day to effective communication, making sure that the message that you're delivering delivering is received with the um, the sentiment that it was intended as well. I think communication training is very important for leaders. And, and in this day and age, you're so right. I mean, technology is changing everything so much. And it's not just now because of AI and so many jobs really being affected. It was happening right back in the day. You know, when I when I um, went to uni so many years ago, and it was it was in the, the the late seventies, early eighties as well, because I think we're about the same age, Trevor. Um, when I graduated, and it was originally in graphic design and technical illustration, the year after I graduated, everything was automated. There was AutoCAD, and everything that I'd learned to do manually physically, manually, had completely changed and was being computerized. And so that was a bit of a waste. I think I was two years ahead of my time or four years ahead of my time. Yeah. <laughs> and then I had to reinvent again and learn again. But having a, an attitude of, okay, how can I stay on top of the changing world of work is very important. And to be aware of how technology could um, affect your role as well, especially these days with chat GPT and AI and technology and cybersecurity and all of that, the types of roles that are very in demand now have changed quite a lot. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's uh, I look at certainly I, as someone who's had to, um, deliver messages about redundancy uh, many times in, in that industry, in the newspaper industry. Uh, it was actually easier if it was the entire team that was going. Mm -hmm. uh, look, we've decided that, or the business has decided that they go, and I'm making this one up, it didn't actually occur, but we're going to outsource all of our IT support. Mm -hmm. So the entire IT in-house team was my, would have been made redundant and we're going to outsource that. It was actually easier to deliver that because the entire team was going. It was where individuals roles were being that so we've got to cut our sales team back from six to four uh, we've because we're doing that we don't need as much admin support because we've now only got four sales people so we're going to cut the admin back from three to one mm. uh, and it was the the ones who were going and looking at the ones who were still there and saying well why is it me and not them why is it my role and not theirs so you, as a, a a business owner or a manager you've got to have all of your ducks in a row about well this is the reason why with three people doing identical roles this is why these two roles were taken out and this one was kept yeah. And even though you could be told till the cows come home, this is not personal, it's a business decision. It feels personal. And the fact mm -hmm. that it feels personal needs to be addressed. And I think providing that uh, support for exiting employees is very, very um, important. Now, Trevor, for all that you do, if people want to get in touch with you and have a chat or find out more about Tripod, where's the best place for them to find you? Well, there won't be too many Trevor Weedings on LinkedIn. I think I'm the only one, but I'm not brave enough to make that statement out loud just in case. But have a look and see. So find me on LinkedIn. I'm very happy to connect with people. Tripod.com.au and it's T-R-Y-Pod, as you can see on, oh, it's that side, on the logo. Uh, <laughs> T-R-Y-Pod.com.au. Reach out there as well with an email and uh, have a chat. Um, even if we are not the right solution for your business the chances are we know someone who is or can assist further and again that comes back to that law of reciprocity mm. um, we you may not need us now but you probably need our advice and assistance now and uh, you may need us in the future or you will refer us to someone in the future who does Yes. And and I can I can vouch for Trevor, one of the nicest, genuine, authentic people that I've I've met, and um, with a really huge heart as well. So I want to say thank you so much, Trevor, uh, for joining me on your career podcast. Do you want to leave us with a parting thought? Parting thought, I would say, um, given the way we've just talked about you and I being a similar age, um, everything I read tells me that people who are, what are we up to now? Gen Z, isn't it? Yes. Are far more likely to change roles more frequently than you and I may have in our time and, and 
do so from there. Um, to anyone sitting between Gen Z and us who are the tail end of the boomers, all those other ones in between, um, <laughs> don't worry if a change has to occur. Um, try and see some opportunity. And it, look, it'll always be a bit bleak, but try and see some opportunity. And uh, when you are in a job interview, please remember that you are interviewing the business and the the interviewer as much as they are interviewing you. Um, I'm very comfortable if I'm interviewing for a role to have the person ask lots of questions about the business. And it, often it'll be things around the culture, the fit. Um, so how do you celebrate birthdays here? Uh, and it could be that they want to celebrate everyone's birthday, but they could be like me, um, those who know me, that I really join in one of those uh, WhatsApp chains where everyone's saying, saying, saying happy birthday to somebody along the way. It's not that I don't like them, I just <laughs> don't get involved. So again, ask lots of questions. Don't be afraid to. And a good interviewer, uh, a good recruiter, uh, a good business owner will respect that and uh, hopefully it will enhance your, your prospects. If you enjoyed this episode of Your Career Podcast, I invite you to check out my career success program at thecareersacademy.online. The Career Success Program is the original program that uniquely provides 24-7 on-demand career support and fortnightly live career coaching sessions to keep you on track to reach your career goals. It is the essential resource for anyone who wants to manage their career effectively, make a career change and land the job they'll love. Whether you're in exploration mode or seeking a new career direction and need help to make it a reality, the Career Success Program is for you. Not only do you get access to my step-by-step -step roadmap to navigate your career crossroads, my extensive training library and exclusive members-only discounts and tools, you'll also become part of my supportive community of professionals who will help you with feedback, encouragement and advice. All this and more makes the Career Success Program the number one place to be for anyone looking to start, manage and grow their career. Check it out and join me at thecareersacademy.online.